We're going to finish up our polygamy series tonight, polygamy part three, and uh, welcome to everyone who's watching online. If you are watching at home, uh, I forgot to say this last week, but we will use biblical terms for marriage and other events in here. So if you've got little kids around, you may not want to watch this at the moment or, or send them to another room perhaps. So we're going to look at uh, the life of David here and the polygamy of his life, which is quite extensive in scripture, all the details that we uh, see through his life. So hopefully we can get through an adequate time. But uh, so uh, in the life of David, and David's one of those, it's, it's tough for a lot of people because David is in some ways one of the most spiritual men in scripture, obviously aside from Jesus. He's very spiritual. He's the man after God's own heart, as the, the word describes him. But yet we just see in the marriage arena, he seems to have failure after failure. And of course, his adultery with Bathsheba that we'll look at there. So what, you know, what gives? Or, or does God give David a pass? Does David get a pass? Is God inconsistent, blessing David with all these wives and this immoral lifestyle while you know, allowing him still to be king and, and the effects of that. So as we looked at last time, uh, Abraham, Jacob, all the ones who did commit polygamy, they didn't, God didn't strike them dead right away, but they did pay the consequences. The seeds they sowed came back and they did pay for it in time. So uh, that's the same that we'll see with David and uh, the regrets that he would have with this. So uh, we see David starts out well. He, he starts out um, marrying pretty high up as far as social status. He marries Saul's daughter. Michael is his very first wife. So this is a 1 Samuel chapter 18. This is right after David has killed Goliath. Uh, it's a, chapter 18, verse 20. Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So Saul said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today. So Saul was actually trying to manipulate David. Uh, David, he's probably still quite young at this point. Of he, uh, he, We don't know exactly how old he was when he fought Goliath, but he's got three older brothers who are in the military, and you had to be 20 to serve in the military. So his three older brothers, and then he's got three brothers older than him who aren't old enough to serve in the military. So at the oldest, David could be 15, at the oldest, really. I mean, he probably maybe was even a little younger when he faced Goliath. And so uh, this is, at the most, maybe a, a year or two or possibly three after that, uh, David and Jonathan become close friends. David becomes the armor bearer for Saul and uh, Saul's right-hand man when Saul goes into battle. And uh, David is the um, the most popular of all the young men there in the kingdom, naturally. He's killed Goliath. All the girls are singing about him. Uh, Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his ten thousands. So he's the uh, he's the heartthrob there, for he's the boy band of, of what all the girls want to want to follow him. They all want to be his girlfriend. And so uh, Michael, even though she's Saul's daughter, she's the princess, but she falls along with the, lo the rest of the girls, and she wants to marry him. She actually loves him. And so Saul, he's like, oh, I, I got a plan. I can, I can manipulate him. So Saul, he's got this scheme where David, he can go out and, oh, if you kill 100 Philistines, that will be the dowry. You don't, you don't have to pay any money or any kind of bride price in order to marry into my family that you just, you kill these Philistines and then I'll let you marry into the royal family. So he's hoping David will get killed. He will go out and battle expose himself too much and he'll get killed. But David goes out and actually kills, I think, 200 Philistines and uh, then comes back to Saul and is able to uh, marry Michael. So that's an interesting, um, interesting payment in order to get your wife uh, there, but that's uh, what goes on. So Michael uh, helps David eventually as the, as the years go on when David and Saul begin to have tension because Saul senses the Spirit of God has left him and has gone to David and Saul is jealous and throwing spears at David all the time. And so there comes a point where they have to part ways, and David is hiding back at his house, and Saul sends guards to come arrest him, and David, um, Michael helps David escape. So she chooses David over her own father. She helps David get out, and she acts, disguises a, a statue, or I can't remember what it was, in the bed, and, and the soldiers, uh, he, he's able to get some time and get ahead of the soldiers and get away. 
Um, but then poor Michael um, saw daughters of kings were in a very precarious place because they were bargaining chips in your relationships with all the other countries around you. So if you wanted to make peace with this country, if you're a king, you send one of your daughters to go marry the prince or marry the king of that country. <laughs> so it, it was tough being a princess, for sure. And so the... Um, so Saul's like, well, you know, David's on the run. He's going to be on the run for about eight years. And so Saul takes Michael and forces her to marry this other guy uh, so he can use her as, as a political influence there. It, it's a sad deal for her and not exactly her choice with that, but it's sad. So that was David's first wife. Uh, should have stopped there, of course. And, and you know, they did love each other during those early years, but then they are separated for quite a bit as the next several years go on. It's going to be a while till Saul is killed in battle until David assumes the throne. So Michael, she's kind of on the sidelines. So then David is on the run. He's on the run from Saul and he, um, you know, you get lonely. So you get, you get some more wives while you're, while you're on the run. So he brings in two more wives uh, there while he's fleeing from Saul, uh, goes to this town and this town and hides in various places. So he adds uh, two more, Abigail and uh, Ahinoam. I think he actually added Ahinoam first and Abigail. And Abigail, that's one of those of so often um, is talked about, uh, oh, one of the great love stories of the Bible, David and Abigail, right up there with Boaz and Ruth and the other love stories in the Bible. And it, you know, it, it's a nice chapter. And I remember uh, being in Bible college, and, and there, were, there were two kinds of people in Bible college. There were the people who were dating and seriously engaged, and then there were the single people, which uh, I graduated single from Bible college, Katie and I, and Katie and I didn't meet. She was still in high school, so it was kind of, we couldn't get married in college, but um, anyway, so I was always with the single people, and we'd always have guest speakers come in, and they would always uh, just kind of rub it in of like, well, I just want to preach to you college students of how great marriage is and how much you're going to enjoy being married. Well, that, that's great for the engaged people over here, but for the single people, it's like <laughs> a little depressing. But uh, anyhow, so I think Drew and Ashley, y'all y'all resonate with that from Bible college there. Of, was it was it the same for y'all a little bit of some of, you know, the, this crowd and that crowd? So anyways, y'all uh, y'all know the, the status with that. But the... Um, uh, so this was one of the stories. Uh, I just want to tell you, you kids, how great marriage is. We're going to talk about David and Abigail. What a wonderful love story in the Bible. Well, okay, except there's a little monkey wrench at the at the end of that love story, and that's that David's already got two other wives there. So that kind of kind of puts a damper on that celebration. So uh, yeah, so there's this guy. Nabal, of, he's a, a wealthy landover, landowner, but he's a jerk, and he's David has kind of protected his flocks and his herdsmen while he's been on the run, and uh, he doesn't want to do anything to help David out or pay David back for this kind service. And so God eventually kills Nabal, and, and David was thinking about killing him, and Abigail stopped it. And so then Nabal dies, and Abigail comes and becomes David, David's wife, and a beautiful love story. Well, except <laughs> verse 25, or chapter 25, verse uh, 42, uh, so Abigail arose in haste, and rode on a donkey, attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David, and became his wife. This was after her husband had died. So, however, David also took a Hinoam of Jezreel, and so both of them were his wives. Uh, but Saul had given Michael his daughter, David's wife, his first wife, uh, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. So, uh, there, so he's at wife number three by now, even though number one is sidelined for several years. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's a it's a mess of a situation there, um, and so and and it is interesting as we'll look at this. Abigail, she was a legitimate widow. Nabal had died, but she's always called the wife of Nabal even after she marries David. I, I think that's kind of odd, uh, what the scripture uh, puts in there. So um, yeah, just a lot of uh, now. Michael, she's going to come back. Uh, I'm not going to show every verse because there's a lot of chapters on the life of David. But uh, when, um, when David finally becomes king, Saul dies, David becomes king, and there's war between David and the last of Saul's surviving sons. There's war for a while, and the, the son really isn't the ruler, it's, David, or it's Saul's uncle Abner is the, the power behind the throne. So it's Abner versus David, and they're fighting Abner and Saul's last son. They get into a spat over a woman, and so Abner decides to make peace with David. 
And um, David says, well, hey, if you're really serious about peace, how about you give back Michael, give back my first wife to me? And so, the, so Abner goes, Uncle Abner shows up, hey, Michael, leave your your husband you've had the last eight years, and go back to your first husband over there. And so they do that, and it's just like, uh, it, it's, a, it's a Jerry Springer episode, essentially, is what, what we have with this. So Michael, she does reunite with David's household, but when David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, after uh, he moves the capital to Jerusalem, brings the ark back, and Uzzah dies, and because and, they do it the wrong way. But when they finally get it there, David, he's celebrating, and he's praising God, and, and it talks that he, he dances with the ephod, not entirely sure what that means. Is it like a marching band, or you know, what it happens? But, but Michael, she's, she had grown up in the royal palace, and she is appalled that David would do something so beneath the office of a king, that he would worship and to display himself so flamboyantly like that in his worship of the Lord. And so she, she despises him, and with that disagreement, uh, they, kinda, they stay married, but they're, they separate physically, and she has no children for the rest of her life. And probably, um, you know, probably part of God's plan with that, uh, you know, of Saul, when Saul had committed disobedience and God had had taken the kingdom away from Saul, it wouldn't have been necessarily right for the Messiah to come from the line of Saul because Michael is Saul's daughter. So it probably God's able to use those things, but it, it's still a mess of a, of a situation for sure. It's not it's no fun to get replaced as a spouse, uh, especially while you're still alive. It's, it's one thing after you're dead, but while you're still alive, that's uh, that's a bad situation. So. Uh, one hint that we have in Scripture as to perhaps why David behaves this way is he, he has an improper view of marriage, as did the majority of people back at this time of history. You know, there were some people that there was good marriages of Ruth and Boaz and Isaac and Rebecca, but, uh, but there's some that um, for the majority of it, women were property and women were just traded like cattle, essentially, in a sad situation. And, and like I said two weeks ago, Jesus, the teachings of Jesus in Christianity and good men rising up and standing to stop evil men has done more to lift women throughout history than, than anything else. Um, but we see David has a wrong view of love. And we get this when Saul is killed in battle, and not just Saul, but David's best friend Jonathan and all of Saul's sons, except for the very youngest, are killed in this battle as well. And so when Saul is mourning Jonathan, he writes this song in uh, remembrance of them. And he says in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 24, it says, O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. So that's a, that's a line David writes in his song, his, his funeral song that he writes for Saul and Jonathan. And that's a, that's a little strange that, you're, that my love for you was greater than the love that I have for women. Now, there's some atheist groups and homosexual groups that try to make this like some kind of bromance homosexual relationship between Jonathan and David, which is, that's not the case at all, certainly. But what this is, David, it's, you know, David and Jonathan, that was a great friendship. But David's problem is he doesn't have the right attitude toward his wife. <laughs> you know, how can you have a greater love? Um, how can you love women the right way when it's spread among so many? That's the problem of uh, you know, as uh, you know, any kind of uh, movie or, or things that try to um, you try to portray men who who have relationships with many many women. It's like, well, you know, some men they they just can't. They have so much love, they just can't uh, contain it with just one woman. They just have to share that love. <laughs> no, that's not that's not the case. No matter you know whether you know Cary Grant or who you know whoever characters they try to put in those roles, that it doesn't work out in reality that way. Hollywood can try to manipulate it as if it does, but it does not. And so David's problem is he doesn't have the right view of women. He doesn't have the right view of marriage, the right way that love is supposed to be. And, you know, and I got, um, I got my guy friends in life, you know, my best friends from growing up and my buddies from high school that we'd play video games together and goof around together. And yeah, they're, they're fun to be with and we had a close relationship, but that's nothing compared to 
my relationship with my wife. I mean, you know, we're, we're raising children together. We know so much more about each other. And, you know, yeah, I enjoy hanging out with the guys, but none of them know me like she knows me. She knows my faults. I know her faults. We know each other at our worst, but yet we still lo- choose to love each other in spite of uh, what we know. That's what marriage is, and that's what you know, God intended marriage to be all the way back with Adam and Eve, the original marriage relationship, one man, one woman becoming one flesh, that marriage is to be, uh, this isn't just a, uh, a legal stamp of approval to have physical relations. And that's what David and the men of this time, that's what they're looking at. The, the, the marriage tie, that's just a legal device in order to make it okay to sleep with these women. That, that's essentially what they viewed marriage as, whereas God's intention of marriage in the Bible is marriage is to be a true intimacy, the closest relationship two people can have on earth. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's a spiritual connection, a physical connection. It's the way God intends children to be brought into the world. That's what God's blessings to be in marriage, and that's why God chooses marriage to be the parallel of Christ's relationship with the church and the bride of Christ. And and there's only one bride and there's only one Jesus. Jesus doesn't have multiple brides. Uh, There's one relationship and that's how it's supposed to be. So David's wrong view of marriage is why he writes this, why his, his, his bro awesome friendship with Jonathan, as good as that was, why that was the closest relationship in his life. That's actually, to me, that's actually sad that that, that, that was the closest relationship. He's got all these women, yet he doesn't know true love, that Jonathan was the closest relationship, and, and Jonathan died pretty early in, in David's life. A sad, uh, sad commentary on that. But we do see also, um, got three, why stop there? Keep, pump, <laughs> keep running the numbers up. So we got wives four, five, six, and seven, uh, so Saul dies, and David is in, um, he's in the town of Hebron is where he sets up the capital for when he's king over just his own tribe, over the tribe of Judah, while he's still at war with the rest of Saul's descendants that are still alive. So he, he's uh, king of Judah in Hebron for seven, seven and a half years at war with Saul's descendants. And then uh, when the rest of Saul's descendants either surrender or are killed, then the kingdom is united and David becomes king over all 12 tribes, over all of Israel, and he moves the capital to Jerusalem. However, so while he's in Hebron, now he's settled down. So he, he just had, uh, Michael had been sent with her second husband. So he just had Abigail and Hinoam with him while he's on the run to all these different caves and places he was hiding from Saul. So then when he settles down in Hebron, gotta, gotta expand, gotta grow the family. So uh, verse two, th- this is one of those passages in the Bible. It's just like, what? What on earth? So, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His first was Amnon by Ahinoam, the Jezreelites. Okay, so he was already married to her. So there's one. His second son by Chilia, by Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. So, yeah, so, there's Ab- so he was already married to her. That's the ones he had on the run. However, his next son, his third son, Absalom, the son of Makah, daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, Okay, so that's a, that's a new wife with another son. Continues on with the um, verse 4. The fourth son, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth son of Shapatiah, the son of Abitael. And the sixth son, Ithrium, by David's wife, Egla. These were born to David in Hebron. So it's like you got six sons by six different women. That's going to be a problem. Now, when they were little kids all together, it didn't seem like that big a deal. And it seemed like, hey, you know, the Playboy Mansion works for, it's good to be king. You got all these perks and and I'm going to live that way and get away with that for a little while, a little while. But when those boys get older and it comes time to who's going to sit on daddy's throne when daddy gets old, they're all half brothers and they all hate each other's guts. And that's what's going to come to pass. It's a, it's a terrible, so it, it seemed, seemed like he could get away with it for a little while, but only when they're little. When they get older, it's going to devastate the next generation. And he does not stop there. So uh, chapter 5, verse 13. So after Saul's last son, Abner, all of them are dead. David moves the capital to Jerusalem, uh, reunites the all 12 tribes. A new capital takes it from the Jebusites, so a, a new center of government. where you get a fresh start. So bigger house, bigger palace, more room, more room. So verse 13, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he had come from Hebron 
also had more sons and daughters were born to David. So, yeah. Um, and so the concubines, that's what like we talked about last time with Abraham. The concubines are just essentially slave wives. They have no, they're not able to bear heirs. They're not considered legitimate. They're just there for sexual pleasure. For, And it, it's like, is there, you know, surely there's a limit to some of this. I mean, obviously, if you've got eight wives, why do you need, and he has 10 concubines on top of that. It's like, you know, Really, really, it's, it's like the, uh, you know, economists, dietitians, they talk about the law of diminishing returns of like, you know, one, one ice cream sandwich is pretty good. Your 15th ice cream sandwich is, is not going to be that great. And that's, surely there's a limit. To, you know, your first wife is great. Your 10th wife is, you know, does she give as much joy as, the, as number one did or number two did? I don't think so. But anyhow, it's, uh, it's crazy. Um, and so, again, this is why in Deuteronomy with Moses, uh, God specifically says there, as we looked at two weeks ago, kings are not supposed to do this. It's very tempting. Kings, they're the only ones with the influence, the legal authority, the riches in order to do this and to multiply wives. And it's very tempting to do that. And, and God said, don't, don't do it. And we're going to see why. So uh, in the book of Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles, all those, those long lists of names that a lot of people typically skip when they read the Bible. Uh, toward the end of that, it lists David's family um, and the wives there. Uh, so in that genealogy, David has listed and that he has 19 sons and one legitimate daughter from the legitimate wives. And then on top of that, he has... Um, all the concubines, he has sons and daughters, an unnamed, uh, an ungiven number with that, and, and none, you know, t- at least 10 concubines are mentioned. So he's got, before Bathsheba, he's got at least nine wives, possibly more, and 10 concubines before even Bathsheba happens, and then 19 legitimate children plus a daughter from the, ah, yeah, so, it, you know, it, it seems like, uh, you know, he's, he's living the Hugh Hefner life. This is Playboy Mansion. It's great for a little while a while, and then the, the trouble's going to start. So, of course, y'all know uh, David and Bathsheba. That's the main stain on uh, David's life, his sin. And really, the problem, um, and it just makes you wonder why. Why, if, if, a, if a man's got at least nine legitimate, if he's got 19 women to choose from or more at home, how can Bathsheba even be a temptation to him? I mean, sure, she's beautiful, and she's gorgeous, but he's got beautiful and gorgeous women there. <laughs> it's like, about. Well, the, the problem is, so all of these men, whether you know, Jacob, or all the different ones, they have no sexual self-control. Uh, lust just rules their lives. Gideon, all the ones we've looked at. And so they train themselves to, when they lust after a woman, they fulfill that lust. And they, they lust after this woman, they fulfill that lust. Well, in that culture, not according to God's standard, but in that culture, as long as you were married to someone, that was okay. We'll just fulfill your lust, fulfill your lust. As David trains himself to yield to his lust, lust every time, and he has no control over his sexual desires, when Bathsheba becomes a temptation to him, he's got no resistance. So he, he has not trained his body. He's not trained himself to... to to have the spirit to be in control of the flesh. And so when the flesh wants something, he, he has trained himself to give in to that every time. And so, yes, even though he's got a whole palace full of beautiful women, Bathsheba is too much for him. And he goes in, he schemes, uh, commits adultery with her, of course, kills her husband. That, you know, I, I, it's, I'm not excusing his adultery, but his after you, when it's woman number 20, I mean, <laughs> what's one more adultery on top of all that? But, you know, killing Uriah is, is the is a bad, you know, in some ways, the worst part of that, but it's a bad deal all around. Um, and so there, God rebukes him for this. So Nathan, the prophet shows up and, um, and uh, points the finger. You're the man. You're the man, David. Second Samuel chapter 12, uh, verse nine. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife, have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon, Ammon, so the, that was the enemy army that David used to kill Uriah. Uh, now, therefore, the sword so, shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And so that 
uh, that's the curse that David has to bear with this, that violence, the sword, he will never be free from violence the rest of his days. And as those, all those little kids and all these little half-brothers and half-sisters get older, the chickens are going to come home to roost, and the sin is going to be devastating, absolutely devastating to their family. So, it, you know, it seemed to get by. He could get by with it, get by with it, and then there's the tipping point. Bathsheba is too much. Uh, and, and even if Bathsheba hadn't happened, as the boys got older, they were going to be at each other's throats to sit on the throne after their dad. And so we see as that sword comes in his family, David buries one child uh, right away, the death of David's first son with Bathsheba. So, uh, the, so David, and that was the whole reason David had Uriah killed was because Bathsheba was pregnant from her affair with David. And so he, just, he tried to manipulate it, but uh, he can't hide his sin. So he has Uriah killed. And so this, uh, when it's time for this child to be delivered, that, uh, that God is going to kill this child as punishment for David and Bathsheba's sin. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born of you shall surely die. So the child... Uh, this is the first of David's sons to die, uh, dies of this relationship. Uh, just the infant there dies a, a few months after it was born. And uh, it's the world says, do whatever you want, you know, whatever, do drugs, do you know, sleep around, whatever you want to do, do anything you want, as long as nobody else gets hurt. That, that's the message our young people hear. That's what is told over and over in every show and every... Um, every message that this world comes up with, it, 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 do what you want, hurt yourself, uh, it, it, it's okay, if drugs hurt you, it doesn't matter, as long as nobody else gets hurt. Whatever you want to do to you, live your life, no one tells you what to do, do whatever you want, as long as no one else gets hurt. We don't have that control. We, don't, we can choose our sin, we cannot choose our consequences, and we cannot choose to limit our consequences. So yeah, we can, we can say, well, even if I do this sin, I want it to only affect me. I, I only want to pay the price for my own wrong choices. Well, that's noble, but that's out of our control. We can't choose to make all the consequences be on us. And so well, that's what David, yeah, his sin, while it felt good in the moment to be with Bathsheba, uh, he would have rather died in the place of his son. He says that, but He's not able to. He's not able to make the choice with those consequences, and the consequences reach out farther and touch lives, uh, innocent people who are not. Uh, you know, this is no fault of their own, but yet they pay the price for our sin many times, and, and the danger with that. And so, um, and sadly, this is just the beginning. Uh, this this was the easiest of the children that David had to let go. So his first son, uh, there, the infant with Bathsheba, he dies. And then uh, Amnon, so this is David's oldest son, the, the son there of Ahinoam. So this would be, Amnon would naturally be the one who would inherit the throne if he was able to live long enough and David was able to pass away. But when these boys hit their late teens and early 20s, they, they just absolutely hate each other because it's, uh, it's the enemy of my brother is my friend. Because if you're, if you're with me against my brothers, they're my competition for who's going to be on the throne. And the throne is the ultimate prize. And so if we can, you can kill your other brothers, you can be king. And it's a sad, sad relationship. But that's what else could happen when you have all these children by these multiple women. And so uh, we see. So Amnon and a very sad story of the Bible here. So David has one legitimate daughter, Tamar. She is the full sister of Absalom, the full sister of Absalom, the half-sister of all the other sons. And um, so she is the half-sister of Amnon. Amnon's the oldest. Absalom is the third oldest. And uh, so Amnon, in a bizarre, how does this happen? Amnon falls in love with his own half-sister, Tamar, and he wants to marry her. And it's like, Really? <laughs> I mean, you're a prince, dude, okay? You've got, you know, you're probably good looking. You've got wealth. You've got prestige. You can have any girl in the kingdom you want because whoever marries you is going to be the next queen. You can choose any girl, and you've got you to gotta watch the one girl you can't have, your own half-sister. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? And so, uh, and Amnon is friends 
uh, you know, and I don't want to be crude, but the, but the Bible's graphic in these things. The Bible doesn't pull any punches on what it says. And so Amnon's buddies with his cousin Jonadab here, and so Jonadab and Amnon are, are close friends. What a good friend would do is say, you need a bucket of cold water on you or something, or I'm, I'm going to punch your lights out and we're going to go down and meet some other girls or you know, something. <laughs> something is what we're going to That's what a good friend would do. Say, like, dude, this is wrong. Pick, you got any other girl in the country, pick anyone else except your own half-sister. But no, Jonadab helps Amnon come up with his plans. Like, okay, uh, you want Tamar so bad. Well, here, you pretend to be sick. And then when she comes in, ask dad to have Tamar come and serve you and, and spoon feed you soup and that'll make you feel better. And then while you're alone, then you can get the jump on her. And that's what happens. And he rapes his own half-sister, a terrible thing, from the advice of his cousin. And so with this, um, Absalom, her one full brother, he is completely outraged naturally. And, uh, and so he's going to end up killing his oldest brother, uh, Amnon. But again, this is, David has lost his moral authority with his children. So normally, if the, you know, a normal situation, you'd be like, this is wrong. You're going to be executed for this crime. You're going to pay the penalty you should. However, David can't say that because, well, he should have been executed for his adultery with Bathsheba. So he's lost his moral high ground in order to lecture to his sons about what's right and what's wrong. And so because he's given up that authority, they're just going to do whatever they want. David has, has no standing and able to tell him, no, this is okay. This is, you know, this is, this is not how you treat women. Okay. He, he, that, that ship sailed a long time ago. He's lost that. So, uh, it's sad. It's very sad. And, and Amnon is a very confusing case in the Bible, but anyhow. So, uh, so about a year goes by Absalom, the third brother, he schemes, he plots, and he has Amnon and all the other sons out to his place, and they, they murder Amnon there. So uh, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 32, then Jonadab, the son of Shimei, and this was the Jonadab, the cousin who gave Amnon the bad advice, uh, Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother, answered, said, let my, my Lord suppose they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, for only Amnon is dead, for by the command of Absalom this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. So craziness uh, there, but uh, so there, there's son number two. So, you know, so you know, David's committed this adultery. Son number one with Bathsheba dies. Son number two, shortly after that, Amnon, he dies. So the oldest is out of the way. Who's going to take the place? Who's going to be the next son? Who's going to be in line for the throne? Well, we don't really have any, uh, scripture doesn't give us any detail on David's second oldest son, uh, but it, it jumps down to the third son, Absalom. So Absalom decides, well, I want to be king, so I'm going to be in the throne. I've got to get rid of my other brothers as well, eliminate the competition. And so Absalom, uh, because of his murder of Amnon, he flees for a while and is away for a couple of years to let his dad cool off and in the country kind of forget what happened. He slips back in and he begins to manipulate the people and draw the loyalty of the people toward himself and away from his father, David, and to where uh, eventually it gets to the point where he declares open rebellion against David. And he decides to, uh, to chase his father out of town. He, he leads an army, and they come into Jerusalem. And David, uh, as men, they were not able to prepare defenses, so they have to flee from Jerusalem and run away. And so Absalom comes in, and he seizes the capital city there of Jerusalem. And as if things weren't bad enough in the family of David, what happens is that um, Absalom's advisors, they tell him, well, Absalom, the people are kind of wary of like, you've declared war against your father. Do you have the guts to actually go through it? Do you have the guts to kill your own father if the opportunity presented itself? And so they tell him, Absalom, to prove you've got the guts, that you're man enough to kill your own dad, here's what you need to do. You need to take the 10 concubines, the 10 slave wives that David has in the palace, and you need to rape them all in front of the public is what you need. And then one of the most despicable graphic things in the Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 22, says, so they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house, and Absalom went in to his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. So in public does this shameful act to show how much he hates and how much he despises his father. And again, you got to feel sorry for these women. They're just, you know, they're just little pawns and checker pieces in this game, this political game that's being played here. 
And so, uh, so he does that, and then he comes out, and he, uh, his army fights against David's army, and uh, but he gets caught. His long hair gets gets caught up there in the tree. Absalom does, and uh, Joab, David's general, his soldiers surround him, and Joab had, had kind of been trying to buddy up with Absalom, thinking, well, if Absalom, Absalom becomes the next king, I want to be on his good side, but Absalom made Joab mad when he went and burned all of his barley fields, and so Joab was kind of kind of still mad about that, and so Joab kills Absalom there in battle, and uh, so that's like you say about 1815, uh, the 10 young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. So he's stuck up in the tree. He can't defend himself. And then uh, Joab and his bodyguard, they kill him. So son number three is dead uh, there with Absalom. He's, uh, he gets killed. So yeah, uh, you know, that polygamy, it looked great for a while. And boy, at first it was a lot of fun. But who wants to bury three of their own children before, uh, before you go to the grave? That's, uh, that's a bad deal. But it's not over yet. It's not over yet, sadly. So David returns after Absalom is killed. David and his troops that are loyal to him, they return back to Jerusalem. And uh, this is an interesting passage in the Bible. Of It might mean more than what it says. It's just hard to know. There's multiple ways to interpret it. But um, so he comes back, and those 10 concubines that had been violated by his own son Absalom, David can't receive them back to um, to himself as his own wives, is confusion there uh, between him and his son. That would just be a mess. So he puts them aside in widowhood, essentially, that they're, he cares for them, he supports them financially, but he doesn't have any marriage relationships with them anymore. And so he puts them to the side, and it does, that's all it says. It, it's possible he may have done that with the other wives, with the, the legitimate wives and Bathsheba, becomes the only legitimate wife toward the end. That's possible. Maybe not. Maybe he just kept all the legitimate wives still uh, and kept the same relationship, but uh, we don't know exactly. Bathsheba is the only wife in all the list of David's family with his sons and his wife. She's the only wife ever listed that has multiple children named to her. So all the other wives, they just have one son listed with them or, or a son and a daughter. Uh, Bathsheba, David has four children with Bathsheba. So maybe, maybe he kind of saw the light at the end. Maybe he settled down and Bathsheba, Bathsheba is the only one we see interacting with David there at the very end. When he's about to die, when Solomon's about to become king, Bathsheba's there around him. We don't see any of the other wives. We don't see anything from Abigail or Ahinoam or, or any dialogue from them. So maybe the same thing. Maybe as the concubines were kind of pushed to the side, Maybe the other legitimate wives were, and, and Bathsheba kind of becomes the exclusive wife. I don't know. It, it, that's a possibility, or it's a possibility uh, it didn't happen. So, uh, but uh, 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 3, David came to his house at Jerusalem, comes back from battle with Absalom. The king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, put them in seclusion, supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut until the day of their death, living in widowhood. And then in uh, uh, First Chronicles chapter 3, verse 5, uh, Bathsheba's children, uh, now these were born unto David in Jerusalem, Shimea, uh, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon, for by Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. So um, one of those may have been that first son that died, or, or you know, we don't know, it doesn't say which one, but of course Solomon's the one that becomes king, and... Um, I believe it's the uh, Nathan as the one. In the genealogy of Jesus, there's a split. So Joseph, Joseph's line, even, he's just the stepfather of Jesus, but Joseph's line is through the kingly line. Mary's line uh, is not through the kingly line. So I, I think it was Nathan that is uh, that Mary's line. That's in Luke chapter 3 uh, there if you want to look that up. But, um, but you know, the, Jesus is physically a descendant of David through Mary, but also kingly authority through uh, stepfather Joseph. And so, uh, and then one of the, <laughs> to me, this is very much one of the great mysteries of the Bible. I don't have the verses up here, but when David is old, 1 Kings chapter 1, it's, um, it says David is old and he can't retain heat anymore. And so uh, 
He's got all these women there around, which are probably younger than him, but yet it's it, one of the weirdest things that I cannot wrap my brain around. They, they pick a young girl, a virgin girl, who you know never known a man, and she becomes a wife in name to David to lay on him in the bed and keep him warm, but she never has sexual relations with him. So they never uh, have a marriage relationship, but she's there to keep him warm. And I, I was like, you know, and I've talked to other people like this, like, you know, throw another log on the fire. <laughs> I mean, I, another rug or, or, you know, blanket. I don't, I don't know. I, why on, I mean, seriously, I mean, why on earth? And it's one of the saddest things because she's considered a wife of David, but she's never able to, to have a marriage relationship. And then David died. This is at the very end of his life. He dies and then she's not allowed to marry anybody. And she's got to be you know, a young girl and got to spend her whole life as a as a widow, essentially. It's like, what a terrible kind of... And, and it's, it was very odd. Uh, last time I was reading through this portion of the Bible, was, um, so David is, is old and, and losing... Uh, you know, he's getting out of touch with the kingdom. His memory's slipping. Just the old age is creeping up on him. And so um, his sons are, are kind of doing what they want. So he, David has said Solomon's the legitimate heir. Solomon's to be the next king. Well, as we'll look at in just a second, Adonijah, the next oldest son, Adonijah, he wants to be king instead of Solomon. So there's a bit of conflict with that. And so Bathsheba has to come into David and confirm Bathsheba and, and the prophet Nathan, like, okay, David, you need to publicly declare Solomon is the king. If you don't do that, we're going to have another civil war. And um, so Bathsheba walks in and David's laying there in the bed, and Abishag's on top of him when Bathsheba comes in. I would imagine that was a very awkward, awkward glance between those two of uh, Bathsheba's relationship with Abishag, but whatever. whatever. They're better women than, uh, than many, uh, I guess, for not strangling each other at the, at the moment. But anyhow, so 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5. It's, uh, it's not all that, you know, people are like, man, it'd be awesome to be in a palace and be a princess or something. <laughs> it's not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> and, uh, it's kind of a risky place in the royal palace. So uh, Adonijah dies. Now he, David dies right before Adonijah dies, but it, it, they're pretty close together. So uh, very shortly after David's death is his fourth son, Adonijah, buried. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 uh, then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. He prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. It says, and his father had not rebuked him at any time, saying, why have you done so? He was also very good looking. His mother had borne him after Absalom, a, a different mother. They were half-brothers with Absalom, but just saying he was the next, he was the fourth oldest after Absalom. And so it's a weird that verse, verse six is so odd in David's character of um, not good parenting advice. David, Absalom and Adonijah are the more handsome, the more good looking of all of his sons. They get a pass. He's stricter disciplining Solomon and his uglier, you know, no one ever has ugly children, but you know, his less handsome sons, he's stricter on them and he gives a pass to his more handsome sons. Uh, not a very good way to parent whatsoever, and uh, but yeah, that's what I did. No, no rebuke. I had never at any time rebuked him, saying, "Why have you done so?" No discipline, completely out of control. Just do whatever you want, and so, um, and that's very sad. The Adonijah just lives his life. I'm going to do what I want, and so he tries to take the throne, just like his brother Absalom had a few years before. And so, when David publicly declares Solomon as king. Uh, Solomon, Adonijah comes, begs for forgiveness. Solomon has mercy on him. However, our sad, tragic Abishag is going to come back into the play. Of um, So Adonijah is going to try to slip, throw a curveball to Solomon. As, as soon as Solomon becomes king, as soon as they're done mourning for David after his death, Adonijah goes to Bathsheba and asks Bathsheba to ask to Solomon. So he's trying to cover his tracks, and he wants to marry Abishag. Now, on the surface to us, that seems perfectly legitimate. Like, well, you know, I mean, the poor girl, she never got to, um, you know, she never got to be married. She had to keep David warm, and what a kind of a weird thing. You know, why shouldn't she be allowed to marry someone? And if Adonijah wants to marry her, you know, why not let that be? And yet Solomon, he has Adonijah killed for this. And to us, I was like, what? What? Yeah, is that a little extreme? What's 
that seems a bit odd there, but in, it's so weird to us, but you know, this is a different culture than what we know in America. So in Bible times, when one king would take the place of another king, he gets everything. He gets the palace, he gets the throne, he gets all the authority, and including with that, you get the wives of the previous king. So if you're Genghis Khan and you conquer the known world of, of Mongolia and Russia, you, all the kings you kill, their wives become your wives. And, and you, you, know, you just add and keep adding and keep adding. And that's the same even in the land of Israel. So technically, uh, Abishag and David's wives that were still living become Solomon's wives. And so uh, Adonijah, by wanting to marry Abishag, while that seems to us in our Western American thinking as, as you know, what's the big deal? He's trying to make a play like, oh, see, I, I have a right to be king because I married the last wife of the king. So you know, I, this is my claim to the throne. Adonijah is trying to do a side door to get back to the throne. And so Solomon's like, I gave you a chance. I forgave you once. Not making that mistake again. So he, he has his own brother killed, half-brother. And so, so Adonijah dies, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 24. So, now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has confirmed me and set me on the throne of David, my father, who has established a house for me, as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. So King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down, and he died. Sad. So, uh, so there was a four, so David buries three sons in his own lifetime, and then a fourth son goes right after him. So if David could stand in front of us today, would he say polygamy was worth it? No, no, of course not. Who wants to bury their own children, much less three of them plus another one die right after you? He would say, no, don't do it. I, I made a mistake. Yes, he was a very spiritual man, and, and he wrote psalms and, and was very enthusiastic for the Lord, but yet... This was the weakness, as many, you know, Samson and, and so many others. The strong man in the Bible, he gets snared with women. The spiritual man of the, of the Bible, he gets snared with women. Solomon, the wise man of the Bible, he gets snared with women. So um, we see you know, David, he would say, don't do it. No, don't do it. Yeah, it was fun for a little while, fun in the moment, but the consequences that catches up to you, catches up for sure. And, and by the time... By the time David's grandchildren, by the time Rehoboam, the next uh, Solomon's son, takes the throne, David's family is going to be away from the Lord, and Rehoboam is going to be turning to idols. So in just because of David's sin and polygamy, Solomon's faith was weaker than David's faith, and Rehoboam has no faith. That is what the, the seeds that come with that, a very sad legacy that comes. So uh, terrible, terrible from the results of it. Uh, and then, so let's look quickly at Solomon. There's a large number, though not near as much detail uh, with this. And so it's like you would think if anyone in the Bible had the, the opportunity to see the mistakes of the previous generation and to learn from those mistakes, like, okay, my dad, he was a great guy and loved God, and he did this right, did this right, this right, but this was his main stumbling point. That's the one thing I need to avoid. Solomon had that opportunity. He had the, the front row seat to see, you know, this is, if, if there's anything I should watch out for, it's this polygamy thing and this, uh, this danger that comes, that, that that's what brought dad down, and I, I need to watch out for that. But yet, Instead, he does the exact opposite, and he goes into far more polygamy than perhaps maybe anyone else in history, and, uh, and it's terrible. And as what we see in Scripture so often, the, uh, and even in our lives, and I know many of y'all have, uh, you know, have been down the parenting road quite a bit farther than I have, but uh, our children, it's often that they... Everything in our lives gets amplified. Our good things get amplified in our children, and our weaknesses, our bad things get amplified in our children. And uh, that's why I had you know, David, his, his good, some of that gets amplified in Solomon, but his weaknesses certainly get amplified in Solomon. And David, that continual yielding to lust and saying yes to lust every time that it comes up, uh, he's, he has no right to, you know, no way to to shape Solomon and train him in it or train, how can you train him to say no when, when you don't even know how to say no yourself? And so 
he, he sets Solomon up for failure, and, and Solomon, toward the end of his life, is going to backslide very deeply because of this, and then Solomon's son is going to be completely away from God. And that's a, a tragedy with the spiritual legacy here of, uh, you know, I do not, you know, I've, I've got my weaknesses like any person, of, but I want my children, I want God to be able to do more with my children than he does with me. I want him to use them for greater things than he's able to use in my life. I don't want to make mistakes that are not only going to hurt me, but set them up for spiritual failure. And I would rather be a mediocre tool for God and a mediocre pastor, which, you know, this is not a mediocre congregation, but I would rather be that and see my children do greater things for God than have greatness and have a church of multiple thousands and see my church, my children be away from God. I, I would rather have, and I don't, I don't think those are mutually exclusive necessarily, but, um, Priority. I, I don't want to be a hindrance, and yet so many of these men, they, they set their children up for disaster. So uh, look at this quickly here. 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Uh, so it was, it was listing all of Solomon's great things. He's got all this gold coming in every year and palaces and an ivory throne and you know, uh, inflation. So silver's worth nothing because everything's made out of gold. So if you put your money in silver during Solomon's time, you lost everything because silver was like rocks. Uh, so that's how rich the kingdom was. But First Kings 11, verse 1, but King Solomon loved. That's a weird thing. The Bible says that he loved, you know, just like David loved Jonathan. Solomon have that love, but when it spread beyond a thousand women, I mean, how, can, how much can you really love each one? Not all that much. Uh, King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said, to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. So you know, the, the Bible puts these, uh, these little parentheses in there for a reason. Say, you know, Solomon did this, but God had specifically said, don't do this. But all the way back in David's life there, when, you know, when it says, oh, he married Abigail and he married Ahinoam, it also says at the end there, oh, by the way, David was still married to his first wife, Michael. She just had been given away. It, it, there's a reason the Bible puts that there, that David should not have married Abigail, should not have married Ahinoam. Yeah, maybe maybe in some ways Abigail was a better wife for him, but, but, but the, the fact that he already had a wife means she wasn't. And so, yeah, if he'd have never married Michael, Maybe, but he was already, so that doesn't count. And so the same thing here. God had said, don't do this, because they will turn away your hearts after their gods. But Solomon clung to these in love, so it's a bad deal. 11, chapter 11, verse 3. Solomon, he had 700 wives. You know, and this is what, you know, my title is too much of a good thing. I mean, marriage is an awesome thing. I, I would rather any, to me, Often the worst day being married is the best, better than the best day being single. At least in my my personal experience, I, you know, I'm I'm for marriage, and I, you know, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. I I say amen to that. However, you know there is too much of a good thing. Seven hundred is too much of a of a good thing. So, there. So he had seven hundred wives, princesses. 300 concubines, and that that on its own is like okay, you got 700. These are princesses for my other kingdoms. They're going to be beautiful girls. I mean, why on earth would you even need anything else beyond that? Seriously. But 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. And so now the, some guys try to explain some of these things away of, um, I mean, how can you even, that's a different woman every night for three years. Uh, mathematically, it's like really, really. And, um, you know, and now these are princesses from other kingdoms. Now Solomon, because of God's blessings of David, David wins victory after victory. He beats the tar out of the Philistines. He beats the Ammonites and the Syrian. Everyone that fights against David, David stomps them into pieces. And so Israel kind of becomes, for just a little while under David's reign and under Solomon's reign, sort of the superpower of that part of the world. And uh, so they're, they're more powerful than Egypt. They're more powerful than... The Hittites and, and the Babylonians aren't a power yet, so they're the superpower at the moment. Everybody wants to be friends with them. Israel's got the strongest army for this brief period. Everyone wants to, to be on their good side. And so the way in Bible times that you made a peace treaty or an alliance with them is that you sent a couple wives. You sent a, a couple of your daughters, a couple princesses over. And that, you know, in our, we're so, it's so weird to us because we, you know, Today, when two countries sit down and make a trade agreement, you got this 
president or prime minister, and he's got his pen, and he signs this over here, and you know, and this the other one from the other country, he signs it, and it's agreed, and it's ratified, and it's it's sealed. So, well, they didn't use pens and signatures; they used wives. <laughs> it's like, well, here, I'm going to send this girl to make sure you keep keep your end of the bargain and keep the peace treaty. And so, um, I kind of like our method a little bit better <laughs> than that. But I mean, you know, still, uh, but. And so it's, there's a very real possibility that Solomon may never have slept with a big chunk of these women. I mean, he may have just like, oh, the ambassador from this kingdom comes. He wants to trade with us. He wants to make peace with us. Uh, and he sends, you know, five wives as a, as a gift as well as a bunch of gold and other things. So, I mean, Solomon may be like, okay, just, just add them within all the others. Or so <laughs> you know, how do you manage a household with all this uh, the craziness? But... Um, it's, there's some very practical problems here that uh, we just don't know what their solutions were. And, uh, and so, yeah, they, yeah, put them together, a thousand women. And so, uh, but yeah, so that, that could be the case, that he may not have ever, I mean, he may have ever spoken to a big chunk of these. They may have just been like, okay, you know, just send them there. But still, that this brings away his heart to where he backslides. Uh, and so we see the danger, because many of these are from foreign countries, and they worship foreign gods. They worship these pagan idols. They don't worship the true God. So they get drawn into this. And they, by the time Solomon's an old man, he backslides and he gets drawn into this. Verse 4. So it was when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. So verse 7. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the, this idol abomination of Moab, the hill that is the east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. Molech, that's what I talked about a couple weeks ago. Molech was the, uh, the child sacrifice god, the god with the, the two hands, and they would put the babies on there and light it on fire. Solomon, wisest man who ever lives, the son of the man after God's own heart, Solomon himself builds one of these child sacrifice statues in Jerusalem. That's what polygamy, you know, and, it, and it's David's failure, David's lack of self-control, leads to a greater, and you know, not that Solomon wasn't responsible for his own actions, but he, he didn't get a good example in his father David. He goes down that same path, and through that, he turns away from God toward the end of his life, and his son, Rehoboam, is completely away from God. A tragedy, high tragedy. Verse 8, uh, Solomon, he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, have not kept my commandment and my statutes, which I've commanded to you. I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. And so that's what happens at Rehoboam. Uh, the, there's civil war there after Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam. Uh, the people come to him and they want him to lessen the taxes, lessen the, the burdens that Solomon had borne. Instead, he wants to increase them and there's a civil war. Ten tribes go split with uh, Jeroboam, a servant who... Uh, becomes their leader, and Rehoboam, he's left with just the two tribes, and uh, and just keeps multiplying this. So so often we see with this that the men who commit this, they can maybe get away with it a little bit, though you know, it certainly broke David's heart to see so many of his children killed, but the children, the children never make it through. Whether it's Jacob's children, you know, Joseph and his brothers, whether Abraham's children of Isaac and Ishmael, what are, the children suffer the most through this, as happens very often when marriages collapse, it's the children that lose out. The only winners are the lawyers uh, there that come up with the, uh, with the lawyers and their fees. That They're the only winners. And the children, they lose so much, and it's a tragedy, absolutely. But um, so, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why didn't God just... You know, God said, don't do polygamy. Why didn't he just kill him? Or why didn't he stop him for this? Well, God works in many ways. And, and often God lets us, you know, we have a free will, free will baptism. God lets us do things and lets the natural consequences of that come into play. And so God let David make his choices. Seemed to be great for a while, but then when those kids got older, then the natural consequences played out. And the same thing, Solomon, the natural consequences of that. And all of them, Jacob, Abraham, Gideon, the consequences came to pass. It came to pass with that. So, yes, does the Bible record accurate things of polygamy? Yes, it does. Does it forbid it? Yes, it does. And does it show what happened when people did it? Yes, it shows that, you know, while it seemed great, 
for a while, but uh, every single time, it just absolutely makes a mess of every family, every family there. So it's not what God intended. Adam and Eve, one man, one woman, Jesus, Christ, and the bride, and the one, the one relationship, that true intimacy there, that, uh, uh, that, that's, that special union as only God intended for it to be. So uh, there's that. It's been a, a, a doozy of a study. Any, uh, any questions there or anything to...